Hello, I'm Daniel Goldmark, Professor of Music and Interim Director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. Thank you for joining us for the fifth in our series of seven virtual lectures this fall. Our next talk will be in two weeks and will feature Professor Anthony Jack with a talk titled, This is Your Brain on Humanity. For information on this and all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at bakernord.case.edu. It's my pleasure now to introduce today's speaker, Taylor McClaskey. Taylor is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Music. Taylor is working on a dissertation titled, Listening Deeply, Music, Sound, and Deep Ecology in 1980s North America, in which she explores the ways in which ecocentric ideas came to pervade a variety of forms of musical expression in the 1980s, including film, popular music, concert hall music, and the very ways in which music was conceived and created. Her talk today is Cultivating Ecological Consciousness, Pauline Oliveros, Deep Listening as Deep Ecology. Taylor? Thank you, Daniel, uh, and thank you to the Baker Nord Center uh, for supporting this talk. In June of 1991, a small group of musicians, composers, and sound artists made their way to the southern Rocky Mountains of Las Vegas, New Mexico. After traveling from across the United States and from Europe, the cohort ascended 8,000 feet above sea level to arrive at the Rose Mountain Retreat Center, where they were greeted by composer, performer, and educator, Pauline Oliveros. Composer Anne Bourne recalls the moment of her arrival. Dry heat stops my breath. Lizards move imperceptibly across bo bo boulders. Thin air, pure, clean light. Standing on the path, there she is at the top of the incline, in the shade of the tall pines. There is Pauline Oliveros, smiling. From quiet disturbed only subtly by the wings of many ruby-throated hummingbirds nearby, I hear Pauline say my name. The group of creatives had arrived at the inaugural deep listening retreat. Over the following week, under the leadership of Oliveros and Tai Chi instructor Heloise Gold, the group would engage in a composer's practice of deep listening. Throughout her stay, the ensemble practiced listening walks through, with, through mountain landscapes, held extended times of silence, engaged in deep listening exercises guided by Oliveros, and created individual and group compositions. This was the first of many deep listening retreats at Rose Mountain, in 1990, at the uh, invitation of Heloise and Andy Gold, Oliveros committed to 10 years of retreats at the center. For Oliveros, the location was inspiring for listening, and subsequent deep listening retreats were held in beautiful mountain environments. With no electricity, minimal noise pollution, and unspoiled access to nature, Rose Mountain was an ideal location for Oliveros to fur further cultivate her practice of deep listening. Deep listening is a practice that requires attentive listening, is based in meditation, improvisation, and drone work, or performance of long, continuous tones. And for composer and creator Pauline Oliveros, has the potential to expand one's consciousness and sense of sonic self. In 1990, Oliveros def defined deep listening as uh, listening in every way possible to everything possible to hear, no matter what you are doing. Such intense listening includes the sounds of daily life, of nature, of one, one's own thoughts, as well as musical sounds. A practice which has widely influenced sound artists, musicians, and composers for decades, Pauline Oliveros' philosophy of deep listening includes exercises intending to connect performers with various parts of their bodies, interactive performances, and listening to all sounds at all times. In order to better cultivate her listening abilities, Oliveros composed exercises to facilitate her connection with her sonic environment. These deep listening pieces are usually conveyed through text scores or sets of instructions, which guide performers through meditations. While deep listening pieces are performed in groups, these text scores are generally read aloud by a facilitator. For example, at, at deep listening retreats, Oliveros would verbally deliver instructions to her colleagues. Oliveros began developing deep listening theory surrounding uh, her practice in the early 1970s, and she worked continuously throughout her career to sharpen her ability to connect with her sonic environment. 
Though she did not coin the term deep listening until the 1988 recording of Deep Listening Album, for which she and her colleagues descended into a 14-foot deep, 186-foot diameter cistern, the underlying practice of deep listening was an integral part to Oliveros' identity as a composer and performer. For Oliveros, deep listening had the potential to elevate the self to heighten states of awareness and lead to richer sonic connections with ourselves, our community, and our environment. While Oliveros was creating through the mid-1970s and 1980s the foundational methods and theories that would support her practice of deep listening, a group of philosopher environmentalists working in the field of deep ecology were also exploring ideas surrounding human consciousness and our relationship with the environment. Spearheaded by Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness, deep ecologists argued that the natural world has intrinsic value onto itself, independent of its human use value. That is, nature has value regardless of the ways in which it may be useful or not useful to humans. For example, a government, may, a government may implement policy which protects a piece of land because it has cultural value, recreational value, spiritual value, or ho holds monetary va monetarily valuable natural resources. Instead, deep ecologists argue that the natural world should be conserved and protected unconditionally, regardless of the ways in which humans can use it. As an alternative to shallow environmentalism, which is short-sighted and which aims to conserve nature for the benefit of wealthy people and wealthy nations, Ness proposed a deep ecology typology that is not centrally concerned with humans. Deep ecologists argue for the right of all living things to live and blossom. Ness explicitly rejected a, quote, man in environment image in favor of the relational total field image, end quote. This shift from conventional environmentalism means that deep ecologists are not interested in seeing the world as a human-dominated realm in which a binary is created between humans and a natural other. Instead, Ness and other deep ecologists argued for an integration of the human into the natural through the cultivation of an ecological consciousness, where humans conceive of themselves as equal members of a larger ecosystem. Olivero's practice of deep listening is nothing less than a sonic enactment of deep ecology theories. Though Oliveros may not have had direct contact with deep ecology writings, the principles of deep listening resonate with deep ecology philosophies in many ways. First, both practices are largely influenced by Eastern modes of spirituality, including Zen Buddhism and Taoism by Native American spiritualities, and by ethnopoetics, the practice of recording to text, oral poetry, or narratives. Olivero's attention to all sounds in her environment is also akin to deep ecologist value of all life. Much like Ness based his ecological philosophy on a total field image, Olivero's is concerned with listening to the total field of sound. But perhaps more importantly, both deep ecology and deep listening rely on an expanded sense of the human self, one which leads to empathy for and identification with the natural world. While some scholars, particularly Denise von Glan, have explored Oliveros' relationship with the natural world and environmentalism, I argue that using deep ecology as a lens through which to analyze Oliveros' work illuminates an intimate human nature connection made possible through deep listening. Deep listening thus offers a practical application of deep ecology philosophies, allowing one to develop an ecological consciousness through listening. At the most fundamental level, deep listening is about being attuned to all parts of a sonic environment and requires continuous attentive listening to all sounds at all times. Olivero's value of all sounds, including the sounds of her own mind and body, is similar to Ness's characterization of deep ecology as a philosophy which is not anthropocentric or not centered on the human. For Ness, a relational total field image dissolves the idea as the human as something within, though separate from, their environment. Instead, the human becomes a part of, or is integrated into, the natural world. Olivero's focus on all environmental sounds, including sound emanating from her own self, demonstrates that she hears herself as a part of her larger sonic environment. 
When experienced fully, deep listening is a constant practice of attentive listening, intended to heighten and expand consciousness of sound in as many dimensions of awareness and attentional dynamics as humanly possible, connecting the listener to the whole of the environment. Deep listening is about integrating oneself in one's place through listening. Olivero's attention to the entirety of her sonic field was integral to her identity as a listener and composer. Though certainly influenced by the natural soundscape of her childhood in rural Texas in the 1930s, Oliveros began to more closely attend to her sonic environment. After receiving a tape recorder as a gift from her mother in her essay, uh, in her essay, Software for People, Oliveros recalls an important moment of realization that would guide the rest of her career. A most important discovery and major influence on my work occurred about 1958. The discovery came with the aid of technology. I simply put a microphone in my window and recorded the sound environment until the tape ran off the reel. When I replayed the tape, I realized that although I had been listening carefully while I recorded, I had not heard all of the sounds that were on the tape. I discovered for the first time how selectively I listened and that the microphone discriminated much differently than I did. From that moment, I determined that I must expand my awareness of the entire sound field. I gave myself the seemingly impossible task of listening to everything all the time. With the aid of technology, Oliveros was able to rec recognize deficiencies in her listening skills, sparking a life of deep listening. Olivera's relationship with technology reveals an interesting departure from deep ecology theories. Though natural sounds are often prioritized in Olivera's language on deep listening, and she seems to believe that the best deep listening is done in natural environments, Olivera's in fact pushes Ness's idea of a relational total field even further than Ness himself. Deep ecologists are notoriously anti-technology and tend to ignore the integral part of our lives afforded by technological advances. Oliveros, on the other hand, integrates all sounds, even those made by technology, into her deep listening practice. Much in the same way that Oliveros' practice of deep listening is based in heightened consciousness, deep ecologists argue that their philosophies require an expanded sense of self. The depth in deep ecology lies in the fundamental values of the individual. It is not enough to make surface level policy changes that only mitigate environmental damage. Instead, each person must fundamentally change their relationship with the natural world and understand themselves as an equal part of the planet's ecosystem rather than a superior member at the top of a food chain. One way to make this change is through the cultivation of an ecocentric rather than anthropocentric sense of self. That is, a sense of self that is concerned with the natural world, not just the human self. As Ness argues, by widening and deepening our sense of self to include the natural world through self-actualization, protecting and caring for our environment will be as morally simple as caring for ourselves. Like Ness's ideal of self-actualization, sociologist Bill Duvall and ecologist George Sessions, co-authors of the 1985 book Deep Ecology, Living as if Nature Mattered, proposed the development of an ecological consciousness in order to create widespread environmental change. By altering how we interact with nature on the most fundamental level and fostering a connection that integrates the human into the natural uh, through a disintegration of the binary between the human self and the natural other, deep ecologists hope to create a ripple effect of environmental change, starting with the very nature of the self. One of the ways that Oliveros disintegrates the barrier between the human and the natural and integrates herself into her environment is through a technique which I call sonic merging. Sonic merging occurs when a performer seamlessly blends their sound into, uh, with a natural sound source. The point of sonic merging is for the performer to make, to make themselves, or at least their sound, indistinguishable from the sonic environment. By merging sounds, the performer becomes a part of the environment, disintegrating the boundary between the human and the natural. For example, Olivero's Sonic Meditation 17 Ear Lie, which comes from a set of 25 guided group meditative exercises, uh, instructs the performer to 
quote, enhance or paraphrase the auditory environment so perfectly that the listener cannot distinguish between the real sounds of the environment and the performed sounds, end quote. In her deep listening piece, Environmental Dialogue, Oliveros goes beyond imitation or mimicry and reinforces and enhances natural sound sources with her own voice. As with all of Oliveros' exercises, this first requires deep listening. One must first listen to understand the essence of a natural sound before they can reinforce it with their own voice. By merging her human sound with the natural sound source, Oliveros echoes deep ecology principles by sonically blending the human and the natural. Environmental dialogue instructs performers to listen to and then reinforce natural pitches. In this exercise, Oliveros is not merely accompanying natural sounds. She is amplifying natural sounds with her own voice, stretching herself to produce sonic material which is indistinguishable from those produced in the natural world. Environmental dialogue is an ecocentric performance and that the creation of human sound is dependent on an intimate understanding of the natural sound source. Environmental dialogue begins with careful listening to the entirety of a sonic field. Oliveros first instructs each participant to find a place to be, either near or distant from the others, either indoors or out of doors. After each performer becomes aware of the field of sounds from the environment, each person individually and gradually begins to reinforce the pitch of any one of the sound sources that has attracted their attention. For Oliveros, to reinforce means to strengthen or to sustain by merging one's own pitch with the sound source. Oliveros adds, if the pitch of the sound source is out of vocal or instrumental range, then is to be reinforced mentally. By indicating that the pitch can be reinforced mentally, Oliveros is suggesting that the exercise is not exclusively about sound production, but is about the intimacy between the performer and their environment. For example, while it may be impossible for a human voice to sound exactly like ocean waves, the point of the exercise is for the performer to understand the sonic essence of the natural sound through deep listening, and in turn, blend their own sound with that essence. Finally, Oliveros adds, Quote, the result of this meditation will probably produce a resonance of the environment. Some of the sounds will be too short to reinforce. Some will disappear as soon as the reinforcement begins. It is fine to wait and listen, end quote. The idea of this performance is abstract for both musicians and non-musicians alike. Though Oliveros' definitions of deep listening are helpful for understanding the philosophical framework of her practice, they are of little use when trying to understand what these things sound like. Deep listening pieces elude description. They are meditative, highly personal, and ephemeral. They rely on the intricacies of a specific environment at a unique moment in time, and they are never performed the same way twice. To help provide a better idea of what a performance of environmental dialogue might sound like, here is an excerpt of a 2016 performance by the Exploded Ensemble from Carnegie Mellon University. In this video, which was recorded in 3D, allowing the viewer to spin their point of view in a complete circle, the musicians stand or walk slowly on Flagstaff Hill in Pittsburgh Shenley Park. Most of the musicians are sounding drones or single long tones with their instruments or voices, but others are playing short repeated notes and at one point a performer even claps his hands.
While this video gives us a small insight into what it might be like to perform a deep listening piece, ultimately a recording, and especially a description of a recording, misses the point of deep listening. Deep listening is a personal experience which explores the sonic relationship with the self, fellow performers, and the sonic environment. Therefore, in many ways, is beyond description. Another way Olivero's work, work aligns with deep ecology philosophies is through her understanding of inside and outside space. In the same way deep ecologists dissolve the barrier between the human self and the natural other, Olivero's conception of inside and outside sonic spaces and the ways in which we listen to those spaces disintegrates the human nature binary through deep listening. For Oliveros, deep listening is meant for both, quote, sensing the outside world and the inner world of imagination and memory, end quote, turning the act of listening into multidimensional phenomena. Examples of inner sounds include imagined sound, remembered sounds, and the physiological sounds of the body. Outer sounds include any sound originating outside of the human body or mind. Ever seeking to find balance between the internal world of memory and imagination and the outer world of sensation, Olivero's treats these two type of sonic spaces with a fluidity that resembles the way in which deep ecologists cultivate their ecological selves. Sonic Meditation 19 demonstrates how Olivero's conceives of and explores inner and outer sounds. In this meditation, uh, Oliveros first instructs the performer to shut out uh, all visual stimuli by covering their eyes with their palms. The lack of visual distraction allows the meditator to heighten their sense of hearing and to become aware of all sounds in the environment. When the meditator feels they have established contact with all of the sounds in the external environment, they gradually introduce their fingers into their ears in order to shut out all external sound and shift their listening focus to the internal sounds of the body. For the final step of the meditation, Oliveros instructs, after a long time, gradually open your ears and include the sounds of the external environment. By first encouraging the meditator to become familiar with external and internal sounds through limited stimuli, Oliveros establishes a distinct binary between the two sounding spaces. However, by allowing the participant to open their ears and include the sounds of the external environment, Oliveros also demonstrates that this boundary between inner and outer sounds is fluid. Olivero's understanding of inner and outer space and the fluidity between those two spaces resonates with one, the, with one of the fundamental principles of deep ecology, the development of the ecological self. This is largely accomplished by identifying with the non-human natural world. Environmental psychologist Elizabeth Ann Bragg calls this type of identification conceptual, cognitive, or perceptual identification in which, quote, the boundaries between self and other are dissolved, end quote. Identification can go even deeper when humans perceive themselves as phenomenologically becoming another being and experiencing reality through the senses of that other being. For example, um, Arne Ness describes the experience of identifying with a flea caught in acid under a microscope. Quote, it took many minutes for the flea to die. Its movements were dreadfully expressive. What I felt was naturally a painful compassion and empathy, but the empathy was not basic. What was basic was the process of identification that I see myself in the flea. If I were alienated from the flea, not seeing anything resembling myself, the death struggle would have left me indifferent." End quote. In this excerpt, Ness sees himself as the flea, fostering compassion and empathy. Environmental activist and Zen teacher Robert Aiken describes another mode of identifying. Quote, Deep ecology requires openness to the black bear, becoming truly intimate with the black bear, so that honey dribbles down your fur as you catch the bus to work." End quote. More than just seeing himself as the bear, Aitken imagines himself living the experience of the bear while participating in normal human activities, like going to work. His identification with the bear is based in sensation, not merely compassion or empathy. Conceptual, cognitive, or perceptual identification with nature can also include inanimate objects. 
John Seed, Australian environmentalist and founder of the Rainforest Center, utilized ecological self-identification with an entire ecosystem as a part of an effort to protect rainforests from industrialization. Seed writes, quote, I try to remember that it's not me, John Seed, trying to protect the rainforest. Rather, I am part of the rainforest protecting itself. I am that part of the rainforest recently emerged into human thinking, end quote. Deep ecologists believe that through the cultivation of the ecological self, environmentally conscious actions would not need to be self-sacrificial because the distinction between the human self and the natural other does not exist. Through eco-identification with the rainforest, Seed does not see it as a burden to chain himself to trees in the face of bulldozers and chainsaws. It's an act of self-preservation. In addition to seeing oneself as and phenomenologically becoming animate and inanimate natural beings, deep ecologists also speak as part of the natural world. At a 1985 environmentalist event in Australia, John Seed and activist Joanna Macy initiated the Council of All Beings, a workshop and ritual in which, quote, participants step aside from their human identity to speak on behalf of another life form, end quote. Holding council meetings became fairly popular in environmental and deep ecology circles. According to Macy, the practice was disseminated around the world, and writings about the ritual appear in several publications. Following a deep ecology workshop, usually led by Macy or other council activists, the Council of All Being culminates in the ritual itself, during which participants allow themselves to be chosen by another life form, quote, be it an animal, plant, or natural feature like swamp or desert, end quote. The natural beings speak through their human conduits to share grievances and hardships, confront human and humans and the environmental destruction they've caused, and finally offer humans guidance in restoring peace and balance to the natural world. During the Council of All Beings, the boundary between the human and the natural is blurred as participants imagine their voice to be taken over by natural beings, giving voice to voiceless animals and natural, and natural forms, with hope of fostering empathy and compassion, and ultimately taking responsibility for human-caused environmental destruction. In the above examples, deep ecologists expand their sense of self by seeing, speaking, and even tasting as natural beings, disintegrating the boundary between the human self and the natural other. I will now turn to Olivero's deep listening piece, Listening Meditation, which parallels this type of conceptual and perceptual equal identification by expanding the hearing self. The ways in which Oliveros plays with the fluidity of inside and outside spaces in listening meditation allows her to imagine what it is like to hear from another natural form, much in the same way that Ness sees himself as the flea. Listening meditation is an exercise in increasingly expanding one's consciousness, or to apply Ness's terminology, one's ecological self, through five steps of imaginative listening. Oliveros first explores the fluidity of inside and outside space by bringing one into the other, starting with the most basic breakdown of inner and outer barrier. Oliveros instructs the meditator to quote bring what is outside inside. One way to understand this step of the meditation is to consider it an exercise in conventional listening. The meditator observes phenomena happening in the world and brings it into their body through vibration and into their mind through listening. Next, Oliveros reverses the sonic flow by bringing what is outside or er, bringing what is inside outside. This could be carried out by sounding into the environment, vocally, instrumentally, or mentally. Once the meditator has explored the sonic fluidity between inside and outside spaces, Oliveros pushes the exercise further into the abstract by asking, "What if your ears could be located any distance from your body?" Here, Oliveros releases the hearing self from the physical limitations of the human body by asking what it would be like to hear from disembodied ears. This part of the meditation is not only an experiment in environmental listening, but also disembodied listening. More than a purely mental exercise, listening is intimately tied to the body, which Oliveros stresses through her preoccupation with mind-body connection and the importance of vibration in deep listening. 
with ears that are free to roam, the meditator could explore any sonic environment. However, the disembodied nature of this listening exercise pushes the meditator to interrogate the importance of the human body during the listening experience. Though disembodied, the ears in the previous step of the meditation are still cognitively attached to the human. Oliveros then expands the consciousness of the meditator beyond their individual self by asking what it would be like to hear from another body. Though she does not specify what type of body, it is not far-fetched to imagine that this body could be human. In this case, Oliveros puts herself in someone else's ears, building community and empathy for fellow humans. By exploring what it would be like to hear from another person's ears and to live the oral experience of another human, Oliveros begins the process of sonically expanding the meditator's consciousness outside of their self. In the final stage of listening meditation, Oliveros completely disintegrates the barrier between the inside human self and the outside natural other. Oliveros asks, what if you could hear from an animal or bird? What if you could hear like a rock or tree? Through listen imaginative listening, Oliveros phenomenologically becomes an animal, bird, tree, or rock, and experiences, to use Bragg's terminology, reality through the senses of another being. Much like the final ritual of the Council of All Beings, where humans set aside their anthropological identity to allow the natural world to speak, listening meditation sets aside human identity in order to hear from natural beings. By hearing from the ears of nature, Oliveros disintegrates the binary that separates inside and outside space to cultivate a consciousness that aligns with the deep ecology philosophy of the ecological self. As we have seen, through deep though, uh, as we have seen, though deep listening is of course about listening to the sonic environment, both environmental dialogue and listening meditation demonstrate that sounding uh, demonstrate that sounding or producing sounds vocally, instrumentally, or mentally is an integral part of Oliveros' practice. In fact, for Oliveros, the act of listening and the act of sounding are inseparable. And the interdependent relationship between these two acts reveals Oliveros' fluid relationship with nature. Through deep listening and sounding, she explores the permeable boundary between human and natural sonic worlds. In Oliveros' 1993 poem, The Earthworm Also Sings, a composer's practice of deep listening, uh, she takes the application of deep listening to its fullest potential. For Oliveros, deep listening is not only a life practice, but a way of understanding the universe. In many ways, The Earthworm Also Sings is a poetic expression of deep listening in which Oliveros lays out how deep listening functions in the greater cosmos. As expressed in The Earthworm Also Sings, Oliveros' universe is made of sound. Living, dying, and the afterlife are sonic. All of existence is based in sound and a vibration. The Earthworm Also Sings explores the sonic nature of the universe, a universe that is made of and connected through sound. In her holistic worldview, mind and body are connected to the cosmos through sound and vibration, and it is deep listening that allows us to access that connection. Through deep listening, we can be returned to, quote, the source of all beginning, which is abundance, fecund creativity, brilliant spark, sounding pulse, life unending. The earthworm also sings, encapsulates the potential depth of deep listening, a practice which goes beyond mere listening and ties one to the very essence of the universe. Published in 1993 in the Leonardo Music Journal, a journal dedicated to, quote, aesthetic and technical issues in contemporary music and sonic arts, end quote, The Earthworm Also Sings was written in response to a paper given by Jankam Ernst Bert in the 1992 Glenn Gould Conference on Music and Technology entitled, I Hear, Therefore I Am, Listening in the 21st Century. The Earthworm Also Sings is a 165-line stream-of-consciousness poem comprising of three sections. First, Oliveros explores the sonic world of the mind, body, life, and death. Second, Oliveros describes a meditative journey in which she imagines an alternate self tiny enough to journey inside the acoustic universe of her ear. 
And finally, the poem ends with a short coda which repeats material from the first section, bringing the reader full circle. Um, this analysis will focus primarily on the first and last sections, which deal with Olivero's understanding of her mind and body and her sonic relationship with the universe. Throughout The Earthworm Also Sings, Olivero describes herself, the earth, and all sentient beings as both listening and sounding entities. For Oliveros, the entire cosmos is simultaneously listening and sounding in a symbiotic, continuous cycle. She begins the poem with a description of her listening and sounding self. Quote, I hear, I am, I receive what is, no argument. My body is sound. Sound is the, uh, is the fiber of my being and of all sentient beings without exception. From the start, there is no question that Oliveros thinks of her existence as sonic, likely referencing the title of Berndt's Glenn Gould's conference paper, which itself is a play on Descartes' uh, I think, therefore I am. Oliveros' opening lines are a statement of certain self-knowledge, but it is not just hearing that defines her existence. While hearing, she is also made of sound. Several stanzas later, Oliveros further explains her sounding self, describing how her, quote, bones resonate, her, er her organs sound, contain sound, and that her very cells are sounding entities. Meanwhile, her physiology is also listening, each organ listening with a purpose. For example, Oliveros writes, listening from my stomach, I satisfy hunger and reject what would harm me. Listening from my liver, I purify what I have ingested. Listening from my kidneys, I discard what I don't need. Oliveros' listening organs work to heal and protect her body. From the beginning of her existence, her very essence has been defined by listening and sounding. She writes, The rhythms of my bodily life, encoded in the theater of my mother's womb. I listened from the beginning universal process, cellular language familiar to all sentient beings without exception. At the most fundamental level, Oliveros describes herself as a, quote, community of musical cells, each of which sing the song of its musical structure, end quote. Oliveros' sounding and listening selves function cyclically, regenerating through listening to their own sound. She writes, quote, I was born here to hear all my cells through my cells, end quote. Even on the cellular level, Olivero's very existence is an ecology of sounding and listening, one's self-sounding and in turn listening to that self. While describing herself as a listening and sounding being, Oliveros articulates her connection with the natural world by arguing that the earth is also listening and made of sound. She writes, the earth is sound, guided by sound, and so are all things of the earth. She then anthropomorphizes and genders the earth to show its listening properties. Quote, rocks are her ears recording all of her events from the beginning, end quote. This vital connection that she and the earth are made of the same sonic essence ties Oliveros to the natural world. No binary between herself and the earth exists because they are made of the same stuff. Like Oliveros, deep ecologist Warwick Fox considers a holistic approach in his understanding of the ecological self. While most deep ecologists restricted their philosophies to terrestrial matters, Fox emphasizes a sense of the ecological self that includes the entirety of the cosmos. His connection with nature and the universe can be characterized as a, quote, sense of commonality with all that is simply by virtue of the fact that it is, and that the idea that we and all other entities are aspects of a single unfolding reality, end quote. For Oliveros, this unfold, unfolding reality is sonic, and the sense of commonality that Fox describes is based in vibration. And the earthworm also sings, Oliveros writes, quote, Vibration is the soul connection to the soul and other souls in the universe, our spiritual musical home, end quote. Oliveros' conception of death is also rooted in sound. Quote, the process of dying, also sound, sound of becoming another kind of being. 
In death, Oliveros returns to the home in the earth, where the earthworm also sings, shedding physical body, like the earless snake shedding skin, allowing spirit body to soar at home in the universe." End quote. Olivero's process of becoming another kind of being in death is twofold. First, her sonic body is returned to the earth where it is consumed by the earthworm, which is also a sounding being. It is not a stretch to imagine that the, the earthworm is consuming Olivero's sonic essence and in turn singing out its own sonic identity. In this way, the, through death, Oliveros becomes a new kind of being in that she becomes sonic material for the earthworm to consume. Also, Oliveros also becomes a new kind of being in her, when her spirit body returns home to the universe after death. Throughout the poem, Oliveros proposes that death is silence. She refers uh, to this as a special mysterious silence, as zero vibration and as space silence, writing that, quote, space silence is the resting place of all sentient beings without exception, end quote. Yet, while she portrays death as void of sound, she complicates her own claim by also characterizing death as the state in which she listens the deepest. In returning, in returning her spirit body to the universe, she is quote, gathering learning through hearing what is. Learning zero vibration is not absolute. Learning there is always living, dying, sound, leading me deeper. Even the return of her physical body to the earth is not absolute. She writes, returning to where the earthworm also sings, deepest listening is that for which has not yet sounded, receiving that which is most unfamiliar, end quote. The Earthworm Also Sings is perhaps the most complete description of deep listening. As her life practice, uh, deep, listening, deep listening steeped into every part of Olivero's existence and shaped her worldview. If, as I have argued, deep listening is a sonic enactment of deep ecology, then The Earthworm Also Sings takes the nature-human conception uh, connection proposed by both Olivero's and deep ecologists to its farthest point. Deep ecologists argue uh, for an, that for an ecocentric sense of self, one in which the barrier between the human and the natural is blurred. In The Earthworm Also Sings, Oliveros presents a sonic sense of self that includes the entire cosmos. If all things are made of and connected through sound and vibration, the boundary between the human and the natural becomes permeable, and deep listening becomes an explicitly ecological practice and a practical application of deep ecology philosophies. Thank you. Okay, I think we have some questions now. Okay. Um, yes, so the first question um, is, what would be a good introductory text to eco-criticism um, or to Pauline Oliveros? Uh, so, um, as far as uh, eco-criticism in music, um, Brooks Tolliver's uh, article on the Grand Canyon Suite um, is actually one of my favorite um, musical eco-critical um, articles that I would suggest. Um, for an Oliveros text, um, you know, I would honestly just go straight to her own writings. Um, that's um, how I think you can get to know her, her work um, and her the, the, the best. Okay. Um, Okay, so this next question, how did people first react to Olivero's shift into the abstract, ephemeral experience of deep listening um, based pieces, especially when compared to her earlier works? Um, yeah, so when Oliveros uh, started switching from, um, well, she was always working with electronic mediums, but when she started to introduce um, more ephemeral meditative practices, um, like her sonic meditations, um, she received a good amount of um, support from her institution, um, and you know, she surrounded herself with people who were willing to participate um, in this. Uh, so, you know, it, she kind of um, was able to pull it off without too much um, pushback, at least in her world of experimental music. Um, you know, even before she was practicing uh, deep listening, 
and sonic meditation, she was already in experimental electronic music. So she was, it's not like she was, um, you know, performing symphonies in the concert hall. Um, so she was kind of out there already. Um, okay. Um, yes, so can you talk about other composers and how they've dealt with ecological concerns in their music? Um, yeah, good question. Um, you know, my go-to for this is always um, composer John Luther Adams, who um, has been, you know, dubbed um, the composer of the North. Uh, he does a lot of work um, with soundscapes in Alaska um, and um, the North, uh, the far North. And um, his ecological approach is really influenced by Oliveros. Um, he uh, is working in the decades, you know, he's working in the 80s, but also um, he's still currently working. And for John Luther Adams, his goal is to create a sonic world, a, a uh, environment, an ecology of music, there's the term. Uh, yes, he's looking to create um, an ecology of music. And, uh, you know, his work has done a lot of great things for raising ecological awareness and um, environmental activism. Um, yeah, so Oliveros is definitely an influence on that. Okay, and I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today.